And I, too, on behalf of all of you, would like to thank the organizers of this debate, of whom there were many. I think particular note must go to Chris Horton and the Graduate Student Association and also to the Student Government Association. But there are many, many other people who worked hard on this, and uh, we thank them. Now, the topic for tonight's, or this afternoon's debate is the Gulf War, with particular focus on what are the implications of the war and its outcome for the so-called New World Order, and what really happened, and why. And we are, of course, very honored today to have two such distinguished debaters. We flipped a coin, and Dr. Chomsky will be going first. Dr. Noam Chomsky is Institute Professor of Linguistics and Philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he is known internationally for his pioneering contributions to uh, linguistic theory. But Dr. Chomsky is also very widely known for his outspoken dissent from American policy in the Middle East. And he is the author of over a dozen works on international relations and politics, including peace in the Middle East. W. Scott Thompson has been a member of both the Ford and Reagan administrations. He is adjunct professor of international politics at Georgetown University, and he is on the faculty of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He's also president of Strategic Research Associates, and he is the author of numerous books and articles on foreign policy. The format of the debate will give each participant approximately 15 minutes to make an initial presentation. There will be, on the assumption that some people new to the debate will be coming in late, there will be a, a brief recapitulation of approximately two to three minutes each after that. And then we will have questioning. If either participant feels the uh, need for cross-questioning, there's an opportunity for that, but, mo but both participants feel that the audience will probably wish to become involved. And so at that point, we will take questions from the audience. Uh, we would ask you if the question is directed to one or the other of our participants to so indicate. You may ask a question to both. The microphone for audience questions is located right there. After the uh, debate, at the appropriate time, we would ask you to line up there for your question. And uh, now, without any further ado, let's begin the debate. And our first speaker is Dr. Chomsky. Well, the uh, New World Order is a large topic, and I'm not going to be able to say much about it. Uh, let me begin with a few commonplace but important observations. Uh, first is that for the past 20 years or so, it's been quite obvious that uh, the world is moving towards what's now conventionally called a tripolar economic system, three major economic powers. The United States still happens to be the largest economy, but it's facing serious social and economic problems. Uh, these became aggravated quite severely during the Reagan-Bush years. Uh, meanwhile, German-led continental Europe and Japan and its environment are continuing their economic growth. Uh, the general facts about this should be pretty familiar, so I won't elaborate. Uh, the second point about the emerging New World Order is that of the three, the United States is the only significant military power, and likely to remain so, uh, with the collapse of the system of Soviet tyranny, uh, there is no longer any deterrent to the use of force by the United States, uh, and that's surely an important fact about the New World Order. So what we have uh, emerging is a world that's tripolar economically, with a huge but declining economic power uh, that holds a virtual, virtual monopoly of force with the system of deterrence having collapsed. Uh, now, turning to the Gulf War, I think that helps understand the interplay of these factors and what they uh, imply about the, uh, the emerging world system. Uh, 
To begin with, let's begin with uh, the first days of the Bush administration. Every president calls for a national security review by the uh, CIA and the Pentagon. The Bush administration did too. We usually only learn about it 30, 40 years later. Uh, in this case, one section was leaked uh, having to do with what are called third world threats. Uh, this, remember, is the early days of the administration when Saddam Hussein and George Bush were close friends. Uh, the section had to do with third world threats. Uh, and uh, it says that when the United States confronts what it calls a much weaker enemy, it is necessary not merely to defeat it, but to defeat it decisively and rapidly. Uh, the reason is anything else would be too embarrassing and would undercut uh, political support for the United States, which is recognized to be very thin. Now, several points. First, notice that there's nothing about diplomacy and other peaceful means, which is quite natural. Uh, the United States is militarily strong, but politically weak in the conventional formulation, except that on all sides, that is pursuing goals in the third world, which are quite unlikely to gain popular support and in fact are extremely unpopular. Uh, so it is therefore necessary to avoid uh, diplomacy and negotiations, which are not a good idea in those circumstances, and to gain a quick and decisive victory before uh, popular opposition has an opportunity to develop abroad or for that matter at home. Uh, a second point is that uh, much weaker enemies, which are of course the only kind you want to fight, much weaker enemies have to be pulverized, not merely beaten, uh, if the right lessons are to be learned. Uh, and the lessons are clear enough. Uh, they're directed to various audiences. For the third world, the lesson is don't raise your heads or you'll be smashed. Uh, keep to your service function. Now, the United States will support the most murderous tyrant as long as he plays along. It will crush third world Democrats if they forget their service function. On this matter, the, we have a rich documentary record of declassified documents on the highest planning levels and a very rich historical record, and they're quite clear and consistent on this score. Uh, a second lesson has to be taught at home. Uh, it's given the current circumstances, uh, it's necessary to divert the attention of the public from severe and growing problems. Uh, various, uh, the, way to, the standard way to do this in the case of any state is to try to create an atmosphere of fear and periodic moments of jingoist hysteria. Uh, international terrorism was used for this purpose, uh, the fraudulent drug war, uh, General Noriega a year ago. Uh, but periodic episodes of this kind are necessary for the purpose uh, and uh, quick decisive victories in which you smash much weaker enemies uh, uh, are in fact a conventional way to achieve that end. There's also a lesson for the, th for the world at large. Uh, the lesson is that force is to be the decisive element in running the world and that again is natural. That's our comparative advantage in world affairs. Uh, it's not in the appeal, popular appeal of the policies uh, designed for the third world, quite the contrary. Uh, it is no longer in economic power, but in military power we absolutely dominate. Uh, now the events in the Gulf actually followed this script rather closely. Uh, prior, prior to summer, to say July 1990, uh, Saddam Hussein was George Bush's amiable friend and favored trading partner. Uh, the Bush administration, the Bush-Reagan administrations had uh, given enormous support to uh, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, from the time, in fact, when Britain and the United States veto uh, blocked Security Council resolutions opposing uh, Iraq's invasion of in Iran. Uh, Iraq had become the, uh, the leading, the United States had become the leading, one of the leading trading partners of Iraq. Uh, Iraq had been first or second, depending on the year, in receiving uh, credits from the United States for a purchase of goods. When, uh, House, when the House Foreign Affairs Committee tried to censure uh, Saddam Hussein's atrocious human rights record, the Bush administration intervened to block it. Uh, last February, when the Iraqi Democratic opposition approached the White House with an appeal for parliamentary democracy in Iraq, they were rebuffed. Uh, you'll notice, incidentally, that the Iraqi Democratic opposition did not appear publicly in the press coverage 
uh, from during the period of this crisis from uh, uh, August through February. That's a very courageous anti-Saddam Hussein uh, opposition, of course, in exile, given the nature of that tyranny, which had regularly been rebuffed by the U.S. government, but supported by the U.S. peace movement. Uh, the reason it was excluded from the media is because of its positions, which in fact happened to be right within the range of those of the American and international peace movements, namely strong opposition to Saddam Hussein, strong opposition to, uh, to the quick resort to violence, uh, since that is the position of the Iraqi democratic movement, they had to be barred from discussion, and yet if you want to read their programs, you have to turn to the European press. Uh, well, that's prior to uh, July. Uh, in, uh, George Bush, of course, was quite aware that Saddam Hussein was a murderous gangster, but it was assumed that he was our gangster, and therefore he's okay. Uh, in July, Saddam Hussein began making intimidating uh, moves against Kuwait, the, the State Department had, no, had, not, had a few things to say about that, namely they basically encouraged him. Uh, the uh, uh, State Department made it signaled pretty clearly to Iraq that it had no particular, that it had no particular objection if Saddam Hussein rectified border disputes with Kuwait by force and uh, intimidated uh, his uh, neighbors to uh, increase the price of oil to maybe $25 a gallon. Well, uh, Saddam Hussein apparently took that as a green light. Uh, whatever is going on in his mind, I don't know. But in any event, he took all of Kuwait, an act of aggression, on August 2nd. And at that point, he changed from a murderous gangster, which was quite OK, uh, to an independent nationalist, which is not OK at all. Uh, and uh, policy changed. Uh, there were two responses to the aggression. One was the conventional response that the UN and the world community attempts in just about every case of aggression, uh, that is sanction, condemnation, sanctions, and diplomacy. Now, usually that doesn't work because it's blocked by the great powers, the United States far in the lead, incidentally. Uh, but this time, it was possible to pursue it because for once the United States happened to be opposed to an act of aggression. Uh, the sanctions had an unusually good prospect for success, and there's no real reason to debate it, because it's very likely that they had already succeeded. I'll come to that in a moment. The uh, second response, which was quite different, was limited to the United States and Britain, with some marginal and rather tepid support elsewhere, and that was to undercut diplomacy and to reduce the options to force. Uh, and that began very quickly. Uh, the, uh, by, uh, the Bush administration announced at once unambiguously that there will be no negotiations. Uh, by late August, the State Department had made it clear that it was important to block what they called the diplomatic track uh, because that might defuse the crisis uh, peacefully and they didn't want that. And it was becoming a real problem by then because uh, there were many possibilities on the table, including Iraqi offers. Uh, which the State, State Department Middle East experts called serious and negotiable. Uh, now there's no time to trace the record, so I'll just mention the last known uh, pre-war example released by Hayes officials on January 2nd called for total Iraqi withdrawal from Kuwait uh, in return for Security Council uh, indication of some kind of commitment unspecified on two major issues that kept coming up, the issue of weapons of mass destruction uh, in the region and the Israel-Palestine issue. The U.S. immediately rejected that. Uh, again, State Department officials described it as a serious position that indicated in intention to withdraw. The U.S. rejected it at once, stating there will be no negotiations. The U.S. opposition to this so-called linkage had nothing to do with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, as we know very well from the fact that the U.S. had also opposed diplomatic approaches to the same two issues prior to the invasion. Now, at that time, about two-thirds of the American population supported that settlement, even without knowing that uh, the opportunity existed because it was kept very quiet. Uh, m most of the world supported it, too, including, again, the Iraqi Democratic opposition. Uh, but it was contrary to policy. Recall the security policy. There can be no diplomacy, and a much weaker enemy must be not just defeated but massacred uh, uh, if the right lessons are to be taught. There were some official reasons given for this posture, but I won't insult your intelligence by running through them. 
Uh, now, the reasons for all of this have been articulated pretty clearly, I think, mainly in the business press, the international business press. So, for example, in the Wall Street Journal, a Reagan insider, uh, former Reagan Na Navy Secretary James Webb, had an interesting article in late January, January 31st, in which he described the Bush administration as one committed to brute force rather than other means, which, these are all quotes, which had relentlessly maneuvered uh, the country into an unnecessary war, uh, and it did it because they have a domestic, very serious domestic problems on their hands and they have no idea what to do about them, uh, except one, namely to exploit U.S. military power and turn the country into a country of Hessians, as he put it, that is mercenaries, who will carry out a kind of a global enforcer role, uh, expecting others to pay for it and prop up the economy. He happens to be opposed to that. Uh, others who describe it in the inter international business press are in favor of it. So, for example, the British equivalent of the Wall Street Journal, the London Financial Times, uh, says that the United States must become a, what they call a mercenary state, because somebody's got to keep order in the third world, and we're the ones who can do it. We no longer have the economic base, so others will have to pay us for it. Uh, in the Chicago Tribune, the main business, conservative business daily in the United States, their financial editor has been running a series of articles about this all through the period. Uh, his, he observes that the United States has lost its ability to compete successfully outside of uh, what he calls the security market, that is, means of violence. Uh, and he says we should exploit this ability, we should turn the United States again, he says, into a Hessian state, mercenary state, and ensure that others pay. We should pound on plenty of tables in Japan and Germany uh, to ensure that they uh, buy our goods and uh, buy treasury securities and keep the economy going. Uh, meanwhile, there should be a flow of uh, profits. The, the prof huge profits from Gulf oil production should continue to flow to our economy and to our British lieutenant, also severely troubled. Uh, as he puts it, we should run a protection racket. So what he, uh, this is Chicago, remember, so people understand this. Uh, we should run a kind of an international protection racket. Other countries should buy protection from us. He offers the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation as a model. Banks sort of buy in, and if they get in trouble, uh, it, uh, uh, you know, the government comes across. But the real model that he has in mind, as the wording indicates, is the mafia. Uh, if a storekeeper in, the, in Chicago does think somebody's threatening him, uh, you buy protection from the mafia, they break his knees, and of course if you don't pay up they break your knees, or worse too. Uh, but that's what we should be. We should be the international mafia, uh, and he says that's the only way in which we can keep our control of the world economic system. There's much more to say about this, I see my time's running out. Uh, but let me simply indicate that these are some of the contours of the New World Order uh, that we see rather clearly when the veils of rhetoric are lifted uh, and we look uh, accurately at what is happening. It's not a very pretty picture. It's not inevitable. It's also not unlikely against signif unless significant counterforces arise among the American population. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Chomsky. And now, Dr. Thompson. It's always nice to come after somebody who, who says such uh, acceptable and everyday things as uh, Professor Chomsky. Um, the, uh, I want to take a different uh, attitude, different approach to the New World Order and to the war, but I want to start by saying a describing a couple of anecdotes that will give you where I'm coming from, give you a sense of where I'm coming from, in what, in fact, I believe our comparative advantage is in the third world, which I have spent my adult life uh, studying in the field in um, Africa and Asia. Um, starting with the issue of human rights, for example, last summer I had the privilege of being in Moscow with uh, colleague Dick Shifter, the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights Affairs, and we were calling on the Soviet foreign minister, Mr. Shevardnadze, the then foreign minister, who described in great detail 
his absolute exasperation. He would pull his hair like this and say how, how Dick Shifter would come at him and they would negotiate until five in the morning over one case and then another case on human rights. And then as soon as they'd finish the second case and it'd be two in the morning and they thought they had the issue settled so they could go to the UN and be friendly, Shifter would say, no, 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 there's two more we have to do or no goodwill. And they'd go till five o'clock in the morning and after six months, nine months of this, uh, according to the Soviet foreign minister, he went to Gorbachev and he said, you know, maybe it'd be just easier to give in and have human rights for everybody in the Soviet Union. And then we don't have Shifter kind of bugging us all night long. I'm proud of that. Last year I was in the Philippines doing research and uh, I was standing on top of a uh, tall building and uh, a coup d'etat was in the works. It was succeeding. There was absolutely zero doubt in my mind that some young Turk majors and captains and colonels were going to take power and that the same, the same helicopters of the United States Air Force, which had got Ferdinand Marcos out of the Philippines four years earlier, were going to have to come and rescue Corazon, Kowanko, Aquino from Melikanyang Palace while the colonels instituted their new government. There was, in my mind, as a professional student of that situation, there was no doubt that that was what was going to happen within minutes. At that moment, there was a swoop from the north, which is where the, US Air, the 13th U.S. Air Force has its seat at Clark Air Force Base, about 100 miles north of Manila, and four Phantom Jets swept down over Manila for about 45 seconds, and that was the end of the coup. They bombed nothing, they touched nothing, they went back to Clark Air Force Base, the coup collapsed. I'm proud of that, too. I can also say, I could give you lots more examples, the, the role of President Reagan's speech in, before the British Parliament, which lit democratic fires all over the Third World, as well as in the Soviet Union, uh, on June the 1st, 1982, when I was in the Reagan administration, and which many of us fought hard to have made. I think that's our comparative advantage in the Third World. It isn't that we do everything right, but once in a while, we do get something right. And the war that we just finished is one that we did get right. Now, I will tell you that, that I, I will agree that we got a few things wrong. I was just reading on the plane this morning that um, detail of what I had suspected had happened in uh, Monday last week uh, when the Iraqi troops were desperately trying to escape northward out of Kuwait. They had already said they were going to leave, and our spokespeople were saying, of course, the usual sort of thing, well, we're not sure they're going to leave, and all of this was, of course, a setup so that we could pummel and pound them, um, blow them to smithereens on the road outside of Kuwait, and further decimate the Iraqi army. Um, clearly, that is what happened in that particular case. All I'm admitting here, conceding, suggesting, is that, is that we did what armies generally do in warfare, and that is, when things are just about over, you want to make your enemy, whom you tried to kill, be as dead as possible. That's pretty standard military stuff. The only difference here is that there's a new thing called public diplomacy and you're supposed to be honest and public and we weren't about that one. So let's concede that one. I think the rest is pretty much, you know, you're getting what you read, what, you, what they said it was, what you paid for, and everything else. The fact that 22 countries were prepared to join in in some significant numbers uh, is no small deal. You all know the story, I assume, about what a nice guy this fellow, um, this fellow is, uh, Saddam Hussein. In 1987, when his army was about to lose against Iran, and he asked what he could do to his cabinet. And this is a known, this is a true story. And one member of the cabinet suggested that he simply step aside for a few days to meet the Iran requirement that he resign before there be negotiations. And then he said, you know, and then we could have the benefit of Saddam Hussein's wisdom back in power as soon as the negotiations begin. That particular minister's wife um, was a mistress of Saddam Hussein, and when her husband did not obviously come home that night, asked to have him back, and for once he kept his word. Saddam Hussein sent the body back in 13 parts, as it happens. Um, there, we were dealing with a monster. Somebody had to do it. And this wasn't just a marginal thing on the part of the French or the Egyptians or a lot of other forces uh, that were there with us. It was, it was important. It was not as such a place where we were fighting for democracy. I wish we were. I wish there were a well-ordered democracy in Kuwait and in Saudi Arabia. Although in the case of Kuwait, we had one of the nicest of all Arab regimes going, at least one of the most open 
that there has been. The fact that Kuwait is already declaring that it is going to move back towards and further from its earlier position, a democratic system of some sort, is indicative of who's putting on the pressure. After all, they have about $100 billion of funds in equities in markets that we ultimately control, and I'm sure they are aware that our leverage over their fares is not, inconsi not inconsiderable if we wanted to use it. So those are the kinds of issues, indications of the way things are going, of where we've put our money. If it feels good to you that we won this war, it's because it should feel good. Because we put a lot into it, and there were very important issues. We stopped a monster who was going to get control of all the major oil fields of the Middle East for all intents and purposes and occupy the high ground of the Middle East and be in a position to dominate, to have a, to have a unit veto on aspects of the world economy if he pulled it all off. It was not inconceivable. So the question really was, were we going to have this war now or were we going to have it later? Given that we had it today, I, the interesting issue would be, how did we pull it off so successfully, given that we don't usually do these things so successfully? Professor Chomsky and I were uh, together in opposing the uh, Vietnam War. I think that, unfortunately, one of the problems is, as A.J.P. Taylor said of one European power, they learn from their mistakes how to make new ones. A lot of um, old warriors on the anti-Vietnam front assumed this was going to be another Vietnam. Well, it wasn't. The issues were clear, and they remain clear. There are a lot of questions that do remain as a result of the, of the war. How divided are the Arabs going to remain? The United Nations Security Council has never had such, a, such an upsurge in influence and real power. Not the, let's not confuse it with the reality that the United States lent it for a time. Nonetheless, real power of a sort as it has seldom had. It is not clear how long we're going to have the kind of backing from the Soviet Union for this kind of ventures in the future, given the direction of events in the Soviet Union. It is not clear how, how willing <clears throat> the government in Washington is going to be to put pressure on Israel to continue to behave the way we wish it to, to take part in a settlement in direct negotiations uh, or in a, an international conference or something in between, more likely, which can settle some of the, at least some of the issues that are there outstanding between Israel and the, other, and the other Arabs. It may well be that ultimately the most important issue that comes out of this war in the Persian Gulf is an Arab-Israeli settlement. I think it's premature to argue it either way. The fact is that the war has unsettled everything. Everything is off its foundation, and it remains to be seen what diplomacy can do now to put it back together in some important way. The fact is that, um, well, and then one other question, did the punishment fit the crime? Yes, we, in, we went in because of an invasion of a friendly country. There have been other invasions of friendly countries that we did not go in for. Yes, it, there was oil there. Yes, it was because there was a, a combination of principles and economic issues at stake that make us, make me satisfied with the, the punishment uh, that was attached to the crime. I wish we could have gone in to every place that somebody has done something bad. I suspect Professor Chomsky and I would also agree on that, that it would be a very, even more unpleasant America to him, and a, certainly a less pleasant America to me, if we, in fact, uh, did, in fact, go in to all the places where uh, other powers had misbehaved, as had Saddam Hussein in Kuwait. Well, let's talk, let's talk just a few more minutes about the New World Order that we hear so much about. Uh, basically, we started hearing a lot about the New World Order prior to this war, prior even to the invasion on August the 2nd last year. In fact, it's something that goes back quite a while. You could argue, in fact, that there's no real discontinuity between what the United States has been doing since the time that it set out to build the United Nations and all the other organizations of the post-war era that have been the bedrock of international relations since then. But um, in fact, the um, New World Order has taken a change. Two things, obviously, the war in the Persian Gulf puts everything in motion in that part of the world. The other thing, obviously, that has changed that affects both that as well as everything else is the imminent breakup of the Soviet Union. 
I do note, however, as a Russian diplomat who's a student of mine and co-author with me of a book says, if, um, if in fact the Soviet Union completely breaks up and all the constituent republics go off to the side, the RSFSR, the Russian Republic, will remain, will still be the largest country on earth and will still be the third most populous country on earth and will still be the most nuclear powerful country on earth. None of that will have changed. So, so deterrence hasn't collapsed. It's just the will to, the will to play a role in this interregnum has, uh, has collapsed. And the United States does have rather a free hand, which it obviously must use. Somebody's got to do something to maintain some minimal amount of order. What happened with the collapse of the, of the Cold War was that countries like Iraq felt that they were free then to invade other countries because there wasn't any longer a Cold War to double check them. In other words, in the past, if Saddam Hussein had contemplated such, he would have presumed that his ally, which was not the United States, it was, United, it was the Soviet Union, got all of his arms from the Soviet Union, except a few exosets from France, got all of his arms from the Soviet Union, and if he then invaded a country, the Soviet enemy, which is to say us, would go after him. That's common historic deterrence diplomacy, international relations. It's the way it works. That all collapsed when communism, that great system that we hear so much about in academe but nowhere else anymore, um, was uh, when that collapsed in the Soviet Union for all intents and purposes. Okay, so that is why that worked that way. What do we, have, what do we see in the New World Order? I see the following, I would suggest the following propositions very, very briefly. One, uh, we need to encourage regionalism with security apparatus in the regions of the world doing their thing to maintain order. Secondly, and obviously, we need a larger Japanese involvement, not just out of love of Japanese, but partly out of love of yen. They're already doing that, uh, playing a much larger role in AID affairs in, in, um, in, the, in for example, South Asia. Um, I, thirdly, I think we need to help in a variety of ways to minimize the destabilizing effects of the breakup of the Soviet Empire as their boundaries shift. Fourth, we need to maintain a moving coalition of states. There will be a few bedrock states like England, but other states in different parts of the world for working with us as 22 did in, in uh, the Persian Gulf, as is necessary, because if we don't do it, at least for the time being, and that means the next 10 years probably, no one else is going to do it. And we would have tiers of allies, a first tier, a second tier, a third tier, and uh, states would be, um, would get, um, obviously would, would be doing this because of their interests, because of their alliance with us in, um, depending on the ideas that were at issue in the issues that were being uh, fought. Um, fifth and finally, and most importantly, keep working on the central principle issues that at least as I see the world, and in my travel in 60, 70 countries in the third world and around, is always the important issue for how people look at the United States most of the time. And that is, keep pushing democracy. That's the big thing. It's what we started with. It's what made us relevant in the 19th century, what made us relevant in the 20th century. We had a new uh, resurgence of it after President Reagan's speech in June of 1982. A lot of countries will tell you that they owe their democracy right now to the good influences of the United States in the 1980s under the Reagan administration, doesn't matter, under the United States, let's just call it that, not make it partisan. Let's obviously restore our economic health at home so we can afford to do the kinds of things that help all that. I think obviously in the Middle East, there's a lot of money that's gonna be needed for the reconstruction of the area uh, there are a lot of problems in the rest of the world which need help. And unfortunately, uh, the country that goes around acting like the, the number one in the world, which we do because we have to, and I guess because we like it, um, is also going to have to pay a disproportionate share of the bills. So uh, those of you who are students, um, well, all of you, we've got our work cut, cut out ahead of us, and uh, it's going to be a busy uh, generation ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll, we're going to pause for one moment while our technical staff attempts to end the musical interlude, which has been accomplished.
how do you feel? Is it, is it something that either of you, uh, well, you have your two minute or three minute recapitulation if you, uh, I if you can say it. I don't even know if I need it. You might want yeah. to because we're having that many come people in. coming in. I mean, I, I just finished and, and no one has to Test one, two. Testing. Testing one, two. Test. Testing one, two. Testing. The most important thing is for us to pay attention to the ideas that we stand for foremost amongst which are human rights and democracy and to continue the pressure for these great and important things uh, throughout the third world as well as everywhere else too. Thank you. Dr. Chomsky. Oh, look. Well, perhaps it would be helpful if I indicated some pleasure in noting a lot of common ground between us. Uh, so I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Thompson that the United States has strongly supported human rights in the Soviet Union, as his first example indicated. We might add that the Soviet Union also has strongly supported human rights in the United States. But the <laughs> issue is, uh, what was the relation of U U.S. policy toward human rights in the third world? Without talking about it, I will mention there is big literature on it, uh, scholarly literature, and it shows uh, very closely uh, that, for example, it shows that torture is highly correlated to U.S. aid, uh, and that uh, 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 the U.S. human rights uh, role in the third world is, in fact, horrendous. Uh, the second place in which we agree is that prior to 1990, uh, Saddam Hussein was a monster. So to take Mr. Thompson's example, in 1987, he carried out absolutely barbaric acts, and there were plenty of others, including uh, the act of aggression, which we supported. And we supported him all through it. Not everybody, of course, like I was writing articles against it. The Iraqi democratic opposition was opposing it and so on, but the U.S. government supported it. Now, from that, we draw a conclusion, if we're logical, the U.S. opposition to Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with his being a barbaric monster uh, because the Bush administration enthusiastically supported him right through the period in which he was a barbaric monster. So there were other reasons. We look for those. Now, the issue that arose in August 19... Uh, 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 in nine, uh, August 1990 was how to respond to an act of aggression. And there are several ways. There are basically three ways to respond to an act of aggression, and there are many. In the recent years, uh, Saddam Hussein's aggression in Kuwait, which is bad enough, falls well within the range of others. It is nowhere near as horrifying as some, uh, to mention one that took place while George Bush was head of the CIA the, and involved uh, an oil power uh, invading and occupying and annexing a smaller oil producing power. Uh, the Indonesian invasion of East Timor, strongly supported by the United States, still strongly supported and still going on, uh, that led to about 200,000 people being killed in the first couple of years. Uh, and it still goes on. So there are plenty. And there's three, there's various ways to respond to them. One way to respond to aggression is to support it uh, or carry it out. Now, in the usual case, say, during the period when Bush has been in high office, last 20 years, in most cases of aggression, the United States has reacted that way, by supporting them, and supporting them enthusiastically. Uh, that's why the United States during this period is far in the lead, far in the lead, in vetoing Security Council resolutions and blocking the peacekeeping function of the United Nations. Now, the second way to respond to aggression is not to support it, but to oppose it, and then you have a choice, two options. You support it by, you oppose it by sanctions and diplomacy or by bombing. So for example, and uh, the, when the, in the rare cases where the United States has opposed aggression, it's used sanctions and diplomacy. So in the case of years, uh, as a result of South African actions. But nobody called for bombing Jakar uh, Cape Town. A third approach to aggression would be to bomb. And if anyone believed in that, no one in the world does, uh, if anyone believed in that principle, there'd be a lot of capitals to bomb. So we could start by bombing Jakarta and uh, Ankara and Tel Aviv and Damascus and Washington. Uh, but of course, we would bomb in these cases only after we stopped supporting the aggression, as we do in every one of the examples mentioned, and I'm sure you know the history. As far as the New World Order is concerned, uh, uh, if it's going to be a world order in which the right way to respond to aggression and human rights violations is to bomb, the U.S. Air Force is going to have plenty of business. 
uh, if uh, starting right in Washington, as I said. Uh, if, on the other hand, there's to be a new world order based on diplomatic and peaceful means, the United States is going to have to radically reverse its traditional policies. And that can only happen uh, if there's a recognition of reality on the part of the U.S. population and a commitment to creating counterforces which will lead to a change in very deep-seated and long-standing pursuits. Thank you. Dr. Thompson would like to make a brief comment. Just that um, Professor Chomsky seems to confuse the a situation in which either the United States is, or the President of the United States is not in getting all of its advice from him on how to do things with, with total support for the other side, or in the case of, say, so South Africa, Southern Africa, where in fact, you know, our diplomacy, I think, arguably, is what led to the break, all the key breakthroughs uh, and all of the key pressure points on South Africa for what has happened today. Chet Crocker did an absolutely splendid job in eight years of hard negotiations. Um, the, in the case of East Timor, after um, the Portuguese Revolution in 74, the um, United States was in an arguably ambiguous and difficult position vis-a-vis -vis Indonesia. Um, it's, we never supported the invasion by Indonesia of East Timor. We didn't protest it. That is not the same as supporting it. If there are 200,000 victims, it's not because we supported it, it's because we were like Pontius Pilate and washed our hands of it. Because there are a lot of things going on in the world, if you're a great power, which you simply can't do. And Indonesia was a, was a close ally. There were not strategic interests involved for us as there were in Kuwait. And we can't go fighting every single war every time. So I think you can always get an audience to laugh by saying we could go bomb Washington, East Timor, et cetera, or, or Jakarta. Uh, but it doesn't deal with reality. Uh, may I comment just briefly on the reality? This uh, without quest putting aside issues of opinion, notice we agree on South Africa. The right way to respond to South Africa was not to bomb Cape Town, even though in the surrounding regions alone, a million and a half people were killed during these years of, uh, of uh, 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 quiet diplomacy, uh, and uh, not to speak of the countries themselves, which is not pre particularly pretty. But as far as East Timor is concerned, the facts are clear. And I'm surprised at what Mr. Thompson said. We did not wash our hands of it. We actively supported it. Uh, the, uh, at the United Nations, the United States actively blocked diplomacy. You want the record on that? Look at the memoirs of our UN ambassador, Daniel Moynihan, who writes, uh, he said, the State Department wanted things to turn out as they did. It uh, wanted the United Nations to be rendered utterly ineffective in anything it might do. I was given the task of ensuring this. I succeeded. I carried it out with no inconsiderable success. 90% of Indonesia's arms were US arms given to them on condition that they be used only for defense. The United States never invoked that. On the contrary, immediately after the invasion, the United States made new offers of arms, including counterinsurgency equipment like uh, Bronco helicopters and others. Uh, as Indonesia began to exhaust its armaments in the war against this tiny country, which was near genocidal, it, it was, that was the Ford administration, this was now the Carter administration, increased the supply of arms. In 1978, there was a new flow of arms. That's when the slaughter reached its absolute peak. From that, and it continues exactly that way. Other countries were getting in the act too. Uh, this is not washing our hands. This is active, diplo crucial diplomatic and material support without which the aggression could not have continued and could not continue today. All right, thank you. Now we will have questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, I'd ask you to move over, line up behind the microphone. I know that many of the political science students will have intelligent <laughs> questions. I would ask you to indicate to whom your question is addressed. It can be either- Yes, for, to Mr. Thompson. I just wondered if you could uh, relate some of the other uh, examples of the Reagan administration uh, helping third world countries achieve democracy? Sure. Um, absolutely instrumental in the case of the Philippines. Um, absolutely instrumental in, um, in fact, the whole league 
of New Democracies that was set up, uh, that had its first meeting in Manila in 1987 role to the United States and to such things as the National Endowment for Democracy, which was set up in the Reagan administration in 83. Um, it hasn't always gone smoothly. Haiti, for example, is having a lot of problems. Look at, look at all of Latin America we put a lot of money into through our aid programs. Um, the beginning of the Reagan administration, most of Latin America was in one degree or another in authoritarian uh, military hands. By the end of it, um, the, virtually the entire continent was in one form or the other of democratic hands. I, I could, we could both, Professor Chomsky and I, enter some caveats about the, 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 the quality of some of those regimes and their ability to survive. Um, nonetheless, um, this was, this is, the record is, is stunning, it's very impressive in Latin America. Um, just beginning in Africa, but um, Tunisia has had some, uh, par has had some uh, regional elections, parliamentary elections as well, where, and we put in some money there for it. Again, in no case, you know, are we the only fa force at work, uh, except in such, in, well, no, even in the Philippines, we certainly were not the only force at work, but, um, but we played a very central role there. But in all of these cases, we certainly played a catalytic role of, of great importance. Thank you. Do uh, Dr. Chomsky, do you have a comment? Well, just briefly, let's take, say, the Philippines. Uh, when the Reagan administration came into office, George Bush was sent down to Manila and he made a famous speech in which he praised the murderous gangster uh, Ferdinand Marcos, who was the tyrant who ruled the Philippines as a great leader, and he said, we love you, Mr. Marcos, we particularly love your commitment to democracy, and so on. Reagan had the same view. Uh, when the army and the business classes turned against Marcos, uh, the Reagan administration finally did too, very belatedly. And that's quite typical. Uh, quite typically, uh, and the same is true in Latin America. Uh, whether we supported democracy in Latin America or not depends very much on your definition of democracy. There is, uh, the Reagan administration followed what has always been U.S. policy. If you can ensure that a regime is under the control, firm control, of uh, 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 sectors of the population which will be responsive to U.S. interests, meaning business, oligarchy, and the military, if you can ensure that, yeah, then we'll, we'll support uh, formal parliamentary met methods. If you can't support that, we won't. Uh, you'll remember that we are the one country in the world, George Bush is the one world leader, who stands condemned before the world court for aggression, for the unlawful use of force, because of the efforts to overthrow a government which was, in fact, freely elected uh, by the standards of the countries of the world outside the United States, uh, and in fact, even by uh, Latin American scholars in the United States and all independent observers. Uh, well, that was because it wasn't under the, under the control of the elements that we back. In, the, in another country like, say, El Salvador, we call it a democracy because it's run by a terrorist military uh, with, a, uh, with, a, with a political facade after the political opposition has been murdered. Uh, opposition newspapers were destroyed. Uh, uh, priests hundred priests were killed, the peasant leaders were destroyed, and so on. Then we're, we'll call it a democracy. Dr. McDougall okay, has a uh, question. One fairly specific question from Dr. Chomsky, a point of clarification, then a much larger issue I'd like to raise. The specific question to Dr. Chomsky in, in your remarks you just made, I take it you're referring to Nicaragua as the country in which uh, those issues were being, the, the U.S. was, as you were arguing, violating international law. The bigger issue I'd like to bring up has to do with what I understood Do uh, Dr. Thompson to be sketching out as his scenario for the new world order. And I noticed in your presentation, Dr. Thompson, if I heard you correctly, that there was in fact an omission of what a lot of people have felt are two really important areas of concern as we move to the end of this century and into the next one. What I'm referring to are, first of all, the issue of north-south relationships, the enormous gulf in wealth and poverty between the rich countries of the so-called North, which of course includes the Soviet Union, um, most of it at least, and the United States, West Germany, East Germany as a whole, Japan, etc. Uh, just within the Middle East, uh, my impression is that there are enormous differences within that region. For example, uh, Saudi Arabia, as far as I know, has a per capita income something like five times the per capita income of Egypt. Now, it seems to me that there's a major set of issues that, from what I can tell, are not addressed. Another set of issues, of course, have to do with the environment. Uh, we are less than a year away from Earth Day. A lot of people were saying that the environment 
together with the North-South issues, have created uh, a different sense of what a new world order might be, a new world order based on what some people have called common security, where the threats to security are primarily not military. And I'd like if both of the speakers could address those questions. Well, Chomsky, well, who is it addressed to primarily? Both, all right, doesn't matter. Dr. Chomsky first. Uh, well, just to clarify a point, it's not, uh, you said that I had argued that the United States violated international law. I don't argue that. The World International Court of Justice concluded that uh, it's a difference. Uh, maybe I'm arrogant, but not that arrogant. The, uh, uh, on, on the case of the two issues that you described, the so-called North-South and the environmental ones, let's, we have to make a distinction. Uh, we have to make a distinction between we, what we, whether we are describing what the United States is doing and presumably will continue to do given its institutions and past behavior or what we think it ought to do. Now those are two quite separate things. Uh, I suspect we'd probably agree on what it ought to do. Uh, what uh, Carbon dioxide emissions which might prevent the earth from being destroyed by global warming. We can think of all kinds of very nice things that the United States ought to do. Now, will it do any of those things? Well, not unless very substantial popular pressures develop inside the United States to compel uh, a change in long-standing policies which happen to go quite in the opposite direction. Uh, that's, I think, what we should bear in mind on these issues. Do you have a comment? I, I think we'd have to get rid of Mr. Sununu from the White House before anything is going to be done on global warming. Um, <laughs> I did say, on North-South issues, I thought I did say, really, as I was wrapping up, that um, the thrust of our policy in the third world had to be based on a commitment to democracy, and then we had to revive our economy at home, which I think is in the process of happening, so that we could afford the kinds of changes and, changes <coughs> and programs that are needed. And I would have gone on to say, had this been part of our subject for today, uh, you know, to pay the bill of the North-South negotiations that I think will be coming due, in due course. This is something also that has to be done regionally, and you were right to put your emphasis on the intra-regional disparities, which they have to do intra-regionally. We cannot really do this from above. Obviously, we can't do it from above anyway. Um, very limited leverage in international fora for the redistribution of wealth. I think, you know, uh, to try to get more than the 14 billion that we're spending each year for AID is, is going to be hard, but the right policies uh, can go somewhere. And in the last 10 years, the, the emphasis we've put on rewarding market economies, market economy principles in the third world, with a result that many of these economies are now growing, and growing in real terms substantially, is the most important thing we could have done for, uh, for these countries. Thank you. The next question, please keep the questions as brief as possible for yes. time reasons. <laughs> this is for uh, Professor Thompson with a comment by Chomsky, if he wants. Um, Professor Thompson, you said that uh, we should feel good because we stopped a monster in stopping uh, Saddam Hussein and that we uh, upheld principle in uh, defeating Iraq and driving them out. Um, just as a point of logic, it, uh, this is something that Chomsky has brought up. Uh, principles aren't, aren't uh, applied selectively. If, if we do, they don't become a principle or they're, they're not a principle. So um, I, w I would like you to defend which principles you think we applied in uh, driving Iraq out of Kuwait? Well, the principle is that you don't invade, uh, that no one is, has the right to invade another country. And, and the problem is that you cannot, you cannot always put force behind your policy on every principle. Now, I disagree with Professor Chomsky on the East Timor case. I was in the government at the time, and I know of the distaste we had there never was, there never, 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 never was a U.S. government policy of supporting Indonesian, uh, the Indonesian invasion of East Timor. It was something that we supported as an ally of theirs with the most, uh, with the utmost regret. And, uh, and that's just, at least that's the case in the Ford administration, which I was in, in the Defense Department. Uh, now, the Carter administration may have been uh, less squeamish um, and uh, done something differently. The, um, I'm just saying that the principle, a principle can be a principle and, not, and be applied selectively, just in the nature of things. You know, we cannot, we are not a world policeman. We cannot go around enforcing our principles everywhere. We have to choose to do it where we get the biggest multiplier effect from doing so. And I can't think of a better case for doing it than this one we just did, 
which not only had a multiplier effect in sending a message all around the world, but it, you know, it might lead, I hope, it, might, it will lead to um, the demise of the monster himself. Well, uh, the, uh, again, there's a partial agreement we, between us. We both agree that no one has the right to invade another country. So, for example, uh, that's why uh, George Bush was condemned by the World Court for attacking another country. Uh, there would have been two UN Security Council resolutions condemning the United States for the invasion of Panama, invasion of another country, except that the United States vetoed them. Uh, in, the case of, uh, uh, in the case of, say, uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, that was invading another country, killing roughly 20,000 people. It went on because the United States vetoed Security Council resolutions and supported it. Uh, in the case of the invasion of East Timor, I wasn't inside the Ford administration, so I don't know if people, if maybe people did hold their noses when they made new offers of counterinsurgency equipment to uh, Indonesia immediately after the invasion, uh, and when they told the UN ambassador, as he has said explicitly, to block the UN and render it utterly ineffective in anything it might do. To talk about the United States opposing, move, which, which invasions we should oppose is based on a false presupposition about the world. Most invasions we support. It's not a question of which ones we should oppose. What we should do is stop supporting them. We should have stopped supporting and carrying out aggression all over the world. Now, then comes a second issue. In the, if we can get to that point, if we can get to the point that we stop supporting aggression, and we can then raise the question, how should we oppose it, then an issue arises. Do you oppose it by bombing, or do you oppose it by peaceful means? Well, uh, in my opinion, you oppose it by peaceful means until uh, the Security Council goes through its, uh, uh, its prescribed means, which it never did in this case because the United States undercut them. Now, here I, in the case of Iraq, I agree with the Iraqi democratic opposition with two-thirds of the American population before the attack and with the rest of the world. Uh, there were uh, sanctions that apparently already worked. Uh, negotiations were possible. The United States refused to enter into them because it wanted force. Uh, similarly, in the other cases in the world, I do not suggest that we bomb Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is now it is the 13th year in which Israel is in violation of UN Security Council Resolution 425, calling upon it to withdraw immediately and unconditionally from Lebanon. During that period, it has terrorized southern Lebanon, which it still holds. Uh, it has carried out a, a war of aggression in which 20,000 people were killed, mostly civilians. Uh, it bombs the rest of Lebanon. I don't think we ought to bomb Tel Aviv. I don't think we ought to bomb Jakarta. I don't think we ought to bomb Washington and so on. These, that is not the way to respond to aggression. There are other ways and we should pursue them. Thank you. And next question, please. Go ahead. Um, Dr. Thompson. Um, I think one of the big problems is the past incoherency of American foreign policy. I know that your point was that there's a new world order, so I'll limit my question to events since the thawing of the uh, US-USSR relations, which I believe that's what you said was the uh, new rise of the new world order. Um, but I think there are ample events since then. Uh, where is the coherency in the US treatment of Iraq as opposed to the US treatment of Soviet Union's uh, crackdowns in the Baltic states. Where is the coherency in the U.S.'s treatment of Israel in their occupation of uh, the West Bank? And El Salvador, U.S. treatment of El Salvadoran government. Well, is there any coherency that you see? And in, 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 um, could you elaborate on it? I'd ask both gentlemen in responding, in the interest of the time constraints which the panelists themselves have imposed, to be as brief as possible yeah. at this okay. point. May I make a distinction between coherence and consistency. I think you're asking for consistency. Um, it is not possible. It has never been possible. I, I'm a political scientist. I, I wish there were a way I could convince so distinguished, so world famous a, a linguist as Professor Chomsky that in the world of political science there can't be consistency. That does not mean there isn't coherence. I don't think American foreign policy has been incoherent. I think it's been extremely coherent. And the reason why, for example, the United States had to be, had to pussyfoot around the Soviet Union on the Latvian issue uh, the Baltic states in the last month was because we needed their continued support on Iraq because they're the northern flank. And so th that's the way international relations works. Do you have a comment? Well, I would just say that U.S. policy is both coherent, I quite agree with you, and consistent. 
highly consistent. It's, cons it's like other great states in that the United States consistent, U.S. policy consistently supports the interests of, uh, of domestic power. That's, and it does it quite consistently. So there's no inconsistency in opposing the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and supporting the Indonesian invasion of East Timor and a dozen other cases. Uh, in the case of Indonesia and East Timor, Mr. Thompson is quite correct. Indonesia is a valued ally. It allows, uh, it allows free uh, investment by the West, free extraction of resources, and so on. Uh, in fact, Australia right now, our ally, is making an agreement with Indonesia over Timorese oil. Uh, uh, to rob Timorese oil after it's been occupied by Indonesia. Well, sure, we're in favor of that. So therefore, we support the Indonesian invasion of East Timor. The uh, uh, Iraqi aggression of Kuwait, in contrast, was going to harm U.S. interests. So therefore, we oppose that. Completely consistent. I don't understand why anybody calls that an inconsistent policy. Next question, please. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Tufts Fletcher School. Uh, just a comment, a quick comment, is that uh, we made and created Saddam Hussein. He's our son. We raised him. We nurtured him. And he was wonderful. We were wonderful to him as long as he opposed Iran. The next question I'd like to ask is that with, it seems that all these foreign adventures that we seem to get involved in around the world that we never seem to, I wanted to ask you being a formal in the government of Reagan, why we seem to never have any money for the homeless, the hungry, for public health access to many people that don't have it. And also, isn't it the fate of all empires that get involved in endless foreign adventures that they end up getting going uh, bankrupt in time? They just run out of money and collapse. Well, that's the Paul Kennedy thesis, uh, the third one. Um, I, I don't think it's inevitable, and, and his, it was a false analogy. Secondly, uh, I, would supp I support um, um, aid for the homeless and an involved in organizations. So that, of course, we have money for the homeless. You've got to support. You've got to support it more vigorously. Everyone else has to if we're going to do this as a matter of public policy. And firstly, that's just rubbish about Saddam Hussein. Look, he got himself up on the shoulders of the Ba'ath Party by, by as an assassin. He was. He never worked for us. He was a Soviet. He was a Soviet agent for a long time. One presumes um, they got. Um, you know, Seventeen billion dollars worth of, 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 of arms from the Soviet Union over a 12, 12 14 year period. They, um, Saddam Hussein had a treaty of friendship with the Soviet Union. Very, very briefly, we tilted about for about uh, four months. We tilted in the Iran Iraq war because we were afraid Iran was going to win too big, and we gave. Iraq, some very modest help. Now, if you want to consider a, a little bit of military intelligence and a few export privileges with 14 years and $17 billion worth of Soviet aid, then, you know, your numbers and your sense of equivalence are really pretty much off. Your comment? Well, uh, there's no time to go through it, but the facts about the United States and Iraq are quite different. Uh, in 1980, the United States and Britain prevented the UN from blocking the Iran, the invasion of Iran. Iran the United States supported it. Uh, after the, uh, we continued to support Iraq all the way through the invasion of Iran. Uh, so did our allies, Germany, France, uh, 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 UK, all of which helped build up his huge military capacities. After the invasion of Iran was over, the United States continued to give massive support to Iraq. We became the leading purchaser of Iraqi oil. Uh, as I mentioned, we became, he re became one of the major re recipients of U.S. credits. That's what gave him the wherewithal uh, to purchase from France, Germany, the Soviet Union, and elsewhere the military capacity, which in fact he had, not as much as was claimed, but significant. Next question, please. Uh, my question is to Dr. Thompson and <clears throat> Dr. Chomsky. But uh, before, um, I have been living here in the United States for 16 years, and I noticed that uh, so-called social Darwinism is still alive. That is to say that the American people, or most of them, think that they are a better race, better people to exploit people, other people, third world countries or fourth world countries, whatever you um, call them. And the United States government uh, does that through uh, such uh, concepts like uh, human rights, democracy, and other things. And uh, in the history, I'm from Turkey, the Ottoman Empire does that for five centuries, uh, saying that they are uh, fighting infidels and they are fighting for the sake of God. And they exploited Europe and other parts of the world for uh, five, six centuries. 
And now uh, my question is, if you come to me as an individual and you want to exploit me peacefully and I say no, what other choices do you have? Uh, what if United States uh, want uh, to exploit third world countries, natural resources, and they go peacefully and uh, the nations say no? What can you do? What do you see as a solution uh, besides being uh, such an aggressive nation? All right, thank you. I, I don't really get what your question is. What uh, other options do United States have to uh, establish a new order without using force we, well, and uh, exploiting world uh, extensively. Well, by and large, we haven't, you know, we do use force from time to time. We just used it massively. Um, when was the last time? Okay, a, a very small expedition in Panama. Um, it's, it's not, uh, it was effective. It was effective. Um, you know, it, it's not as if we use force that often. It's too often for Professor Chomsky it's not often enough for some people. Um, in the last 10 years, 20 years, it's been about right for me. Uh, I don't want to change it. Um, I think that, I mean, I'd like to eliminate it, but I have a sense of reality of how the world works. And there are a lot of thugs in the world, a lot of bullies. And we're going to have to spend some money um, keeping them down if, if they keep trying to invade countries. But, but I, 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 what I heard you say, though, it was much more interesting, your, your analogy with the Ottoman Empire. And I, do, and I realize that we do exactly the same thing. We have our metaphors of, of um, bringing our commitments to, um, to lesser peoples. And um, the results are you know, always the same if, if, if we don't understand what we're doing. I mean, uh, we know that the United States is not really for I'm going to have to. I'm sorry. In the interest of time, I'm going right. to have to. Uh, well, Dr. I Trump, agree that there are lots of thugs and bullies in the world, and a lot of them are well within our reach, a couple hundred, two hundred miles from here. And the solution to uh, the problems is for things to happen among the American population, which will constrain the thugs and bullies. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, my question is addressed first to Dr. Thompson and then to Dr. Chomsky. Um, my question is, um, Dr. Thompson, do you feel that um, the management of American public opinion is becoming um, more or less difficult uh, in the age that we're um, coming into. And uh, what I have in mind uh, specifically is, say, um, a, uh, a sort of event like Grenada, perhaps, um, shortly after the, uh, the uh, catastrophe in uh, Lebanon, our catastrophe, that is. Um, do you find that that management of public opinion is becoming uh, more difficult or less difficult? Well, in, in the first place, I'm not aware of any attempt at management of public opinion. <laughs> Pardon? I'm sorry. What, um, just, 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 I think, a skepticism. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> management, ma management and the attempt to influence, I think, are quite different things. Um, if you knew if you knew how meager were the resources of the public affairs bureaus of the State Department and of the United States Information Agency, where I served for several years, um, you'd have a more modest attitude towards this. The, um, the, we put out a few pamphlets. Uh, we're not, in my organization, we weren't even allowed to disseminate information domestically. We could only go internationally. And so the domestic stuff had to all be done by the State Department, and they were incompetent. Professor Chomsky and I would agree on something for once. Um, the, um, the, I, I, I just don't know what it is people are referring to about, about that. I, I was very much, in, I'll give you an example. Um, I was very much involved in the Grenada thing, but I remember being involved in the shoot down of the 007 by the Soviet Union, and we had a very big debate on public opinion on it, and um, what should be, the, what should be the, the response by the Reagan administration. And I had been told by an elder statesman that that the, the, real, the really influential jobs in America were going to be in the future, the precise opposite of what you people were giggling about. This is a highly informed suggestion that, that the inf influential jobs were going to be in public affairs so that you could listen to what people were saying and input back from public opinion into the Secretary of State's office that kind of influence. And that was where power was going to be. In other words, not you giggling, but you having influence by telling people in Washington what it is you believed in and what you supported. And that's where power would be. And the guys that could transmit that 
would be the powerful people. Well, we, can, we did convince President Reagan not to do some of the things he had contemplated doing in consequence of the Soviet shootdown of the Korean airliner. The way we did it, actually, was we went to Mrs. Reagan um, and um, worked through her view of, of her husband's role as a peacemaker in history. And um, we got through to him on, on that road. Um, but um, public opinion, uh, give me an example of where it's being managed. Dr. Well, Chomsky? Yeah, there's a long, and again, a long scholarly record on management of public opinion by the government. The first relevant major case is the Woodrow Wilson administration, which established a Creel Commission, the first state propaganda commission, uh, as in an effort to drive a very pacifistic public into supporting uh, the uh, U.S. involvement in the First World War. And within six months, it had turned a pacifist population into a raging, hysterical, anti-German population. And that lesson was learned by the public relations industry and by governments, and it's been intensified since then. In fact, there's a large part of the political science literature which is devoted to exactly how to do this. Uh, it's called manufacturing consent or engineering consent. The Reagan administration took new leaps forward in this. Uh, it established an office of public diplomacy, which was a huge propaganda operation. It was illegal, as Congress later determined. Uh, and when it was revealed, uh, and conceded to be illegal, one of the high officials involved in it described their operations as the kind of operations you carry out in enemy territory, which gives you an indication of how they regard the population. Now, KL007 was a perfect example. There was a huge propaganda operation that went into, into uh, action there. It, uh, it, it, it was enormous. Uh, there were a huge amount of falsification. There were lies about it and so on. And to see what it was like, compare it with another similar incident. Uh, the U.S. shot during the Iran-Iraq war, uh, the U.S. carrier Vincennes uh, shot down a civilian Iranian airliner uh, in, a, in a, a, a commercial corridor, killing, I think it was about 290 people. Uh, the uh, response was quite different. Uh, there, I mean, it, it was conceded to be an error, except in the U.S. Naval Academy Journal, where uh, the com a commander of a nearby vessel, uh, David Carlson, said that he watched in disbelief as the Vincennes shot down an obviously commer obvious commercial airliner, according to Carlson, Commander Carlson, in order to test their new Aegis high-tech missile system. The uh, further result was that, uh, that's not me, that's Commander Carlson in the U.S. Naval Academy Journal. The, uh, 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 the next step was that the commander of the Vincennes and the, uh, air, the, com the uh, man in charge of fire control both received the Legion of Merit for uh, their, their uh, extraordinary service during this period, which, and this was the only act they carried out. Now, look at the way that, the re look at the response to that case as compared with the KL007 case. Well, that shows you how a good propaganda system works. And there's example. If you want examples of this, I have two well, recent. I have two rec I have two recent books which go through it in some detail. One called Manufacturing Consent and Other Necessary Illusions. In Manufacturing Consent, my co-author and I, in one part, run through just the Air Force propaganda uh, agencies, just listing them. I mean, they dwarf anything available to, that alone dwarfs anything uh, that you might find in any of the dissident movements in the United States, and that's a small piece of it. But, but could I ask you to tell me what you meant by this massive public diplomacy effort, which I happen to be, I think, as much at the center of as anybody else, and if it was massive, the handful of people we struggle to borrow from one agency or the other, then you and I have very different standards oh, well, of massiveness. Well, I mean, it wasn't massive as compared, say, to the uh, effort to demonize the Sandinistas, which was the main concern of the Office of Public Diplomacy and what they were finally declared illegal on. Uh, that was really massive. This was a small operation, but remember, there was only one moment there. In that one moment, they succeeded in, uh, with a long series of fabrications and lies and charges, it succeeded to the point, here's one indication of the success, the New York Times, take a look at, I don't know if you've ever looked at the New York Times Index, not the Times, but the Times Index, you know, densely printed, you know, I got to practically read it with a magnifying glass at my age at least. Uh, 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 in the first month, in September alone, it was September 1st, that first month, seven full pages, if I recall, of the Times Index are devoted to that incident. I mean, that's, I, mean, I, I, I doubt if there's a, and, and the response was total outrage, quoting 
statements by the administration, you know, about how this is the worst terrorist act in history, and on and on like this. That's a successful management of public opinion. It's true the government doesn't do it alone. The media join in enthusiastically as a state propaganda agency, which is primarily what they are. Uh, but uh, there's plenty of government input. All right, we have very limited time left. I, again, I would urge everyone to ask the question as quickly as possible, and I guess we should ask for as brief an answer as possible. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was curious earlier uh, when I was sitting in the audience, I was a little bit disturbed by uh, when Dr. Thompson was raising earlier about an article, apparently it was in today's paper, which I haven't seen. So I'm responding basically on what you said about apparently there was some, something said about the, the re retreating army, the Iraqi retreating army, well, there, there was some mistake was made basically and people were blown away as they were retreated and that that was sort of a concession on your part as a wrong. What I'm curious about and, and with Dr. Chomsky in particular is I think in linguistics, my understanding is, uh, and having been a former veteran myself, um, that when you have a retreating enemy and basically people have surrendered and are on their way out and defeated, that to shoot them uh, is a war crime. Um, and I'm wondering whether we're getting into war crimes are only determined, a war crimes only committed by the losers. Well, right. the, uh, it was, was that you? Oh, uh, on the matter, uh, you're, you're right. I mean, the Geneva Conventions are very explicit that uh, if an enemy is hors de combat, you know, if an enemy is not fighting, you're not allowed to kill him. Uh, but uh, the, uh, that, you know, there are ambiguous questions about that. But on the issue of war crimes, it's an interesting case, question. Uh, it would be nice, just as it would be nice if the U.S. would support human rights and democracy, or any other country would. We're not different than anyone else in this respect. Uh, it would be nice if there was a serious and honest notion of war crime, but unfortunately there isn't. It's exactly as you said. War crimes are invariably victor's justice. Uh, if you look at the uh, 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 you look at, take the Tokyo and Nuremberg tribunals, which sort of established the modern war crimes tribunals, they were scandalous. I mean, the, the people who were condemned deserved to be condemned, but not in that way. Uh, the Tokyo tribunal was so scandalous that the one independent Asian justice, the one justice who had any experience in international law, wrote a, dissented from the whole thing, said it was just a farce, wrote a long and very interesting 600-page dissent, which just demolished it. I'll just give you, in one case, one gen Japanese general, General Yamashita, was, con was hanged because of atrocities carried out by troops, technically under his command, but with whom he had lost any contact whatsoever after the American conquest of the Philippines. In the case of the Nuremberg trials, if you look at the way in which war crime was defined, uh, a war crime was defined as some criminal act that the Germans carried out that they couldn't show the Americans or British had also carried out. So it was considered a legitimate defense at Nuremberg to bring on an American, uh, you know, submarine commander or something who would say, well, I did the same thing you're charged with, and that was considered, okay, you're, you're free. Well, in other words, a war crime is a crime that the enemy carries out, and you can't, he can't show that we carried out. Dr. Thompson, any comment? No comment. All right. Next question, please. Uh, Dr. Thompson. Uh, your, <clears throat> your thesis is that the United States is usually on the side of democratically elected governments. I'd like to go back to uh, the middle of the century where three democratically elected governments were overthrown with U.S. covert help, uh, Guatemala, Chile, Iran, and ask you whether you feel these were simply momentary aberrations on the part of the U.S. government? Oh, they're definitely, uh, we, we definitely have aberrations without going into the specifics. Um, I, I think the, the case of the three cases, the Iranian one is the most questionable that you brought up. But, uh, and I would also say, 
as a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, Tony Smith, writing a book about U.S. commitment to democracy, mm -hmm. you know, we go in spurts about it, and um, we, we get revved up about it generationally, and, um, and then we backslide in between. It's hard to keep a, any, all of you that have been in government know that it's very hard to keep up um, a commitment to principles in government. You, you, it's easy through inertia just to lean back and do business as usual. To do something different, to make, make a difference is, is, is tough. And that's why um, I hope someday Professor Chomsky has the chance to run a government and uh, <laughs> and, and see just how difficult it is. Professor Chomsky, do you want to announce your candidacy? <laughs> no, if, if I was uh, to be elected, I'd immediately vote against myself, but uh, or, pro, or run a protest against me. But uh, the uh, that's as an old anarchist I'm speaking now. The um, uh, on, on the question of democracy, you can't answer the question whether the United States is for it or against it. It's a meaningless question. You first have to ask what you mean by democracy. If you mean by democracy business run rule or rule by elements in a domestic population which will be supportive to U.S. interests, then yes, we're in favor of democracy. Uh, if the democracies, if a fine democracy that doesn't meet those conditions will be against. Uh, and that's very consistent. There's very little deviation from that that I'm aware of. Next question. Uh, I want to ask, how do you think that the Muslim world will relate to the new world order? After all, all what happened was predominantly in the birthplace of Islam, and uh, probably everybody has seen demonstrations on the TV and other places. I want to comment from both of you. Thanks. Right. Who would like to go first? Well, there's not one Muslim world, as you know very well. Uh, in, uh, from if you, from uh, Morocco to Indonesia, there was overwhelming popular opposition to the war. Uh, there was also opposition to the aggression, but there was also opposition to the war. In this respect, the Iraqi democratic opposition was quite characteristic. They were uh, uh, opposed to Saddam Hussein, also opposed to the war. Uh, there were huge uh, protests in uh, Morocco. Uh, uh, Indonesia, at the other end, was unable ever to condemn the war because uh, the, the, uh, uh, to, uh, to support uh, the U.S. because of the opposition. In Pakistan, although the, go the government was really caught, they tried to uh, give some sort of nominal support to the U.S.-U.K. It was just two countries, really, U.S.-U.K. operation, but the population arose in huge protests. Probably about 80 percent of them opposed it. They had to back off. Uh, on the other hand, there was also support for the war. Uh, today, you'll read in the front page of the Times, any newspaper, about the, great, the meeting of the Arab allies of the United States eight Arab allies. You take a look at the eight Arab allies, and six of them are family dictatorships, families, basically, uh, that were set up as what Lord Curzon once called an Arab facade to manage Gulf oil wealth for the British and the Americans. That's, that's six of the eight. The seventh of the eight is a murderous tyrant uh, who's indistinguishable from Saddam Hussein, uh, Hafez al-Assad. And the eighth of the eight is the only one that deserves to be called a country. Uh, that's Egypt with a basket case economy that received tens of billions of dollars of aid to try to keep it in line and that was so afraid of its own population they kept schools closed and didn't even allow sporting events uh, through most of the period. Well, you know, the Arab world is split like most worlds. Most worlds. All right, next question quickly, please. Uh, yeah, I don't remember hearing about us giving a lot of aid to Egypt as much as I heard that we essentially forgave debts that they already owed us. And That's the same thing. Yeah. But, and, and they get 3.3 .3 billion a year from us too. They oh. got plenty of aid right. from uh, Germany and Japan as well, and all Saudi right. Arabia. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. Uh, all right. It's about $14 billion so far. Wow. All right, yeah, I, uh, I wanted to, huh? All right, very quickly, because yeah. I want to ask a question. Um, uh, what was it? Yeah, about uh, Iran hostage situation in 19, uh, 1979. Uh, now we all disliked the Iranians a lot for that, and uh, uh, had numerous human rights abuses. Forgive me, but I have to ask you to ask your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why did we support the Shah of Iran, and what was our purpose? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in supporting 
<laughs> okay. Him and his I think that maybe fleets. we could end on the note that on this one I can predict that I might say it differently, but we have the same view. Um, but, but I think what Professor Chomsky had just said in this case would be accurate about um, our business interests, the oil, and uh, the strategic importance of the country. Okay, I'm going to... that, we've got to go. Yeah, they have to go. Uh, do you have a very quick question, Susan? All right, very quick, Susan. Okay, yeah, it's more of a comment than a question, but this is to... No, we don't want to comment. This is the question. <laughs> It's a question to right. Dr. Thompson and Dr. Chomsky. Right. Um, you spoke earlier about South Africa, and I wanted to know, do you believe that we would have sent U.S. troops, black and white, into um, support the South African government and thus the system of apartheid, um, and asking our black troops to live under separate conditions and harsher conditions as we have asked the female troops to do in Saudi Arabia? All right, the final question, a tough one. I had dinner last week with, the, with Ambassador Perkins, who was our first black ambassador in South Africa, and I hope that's symbolic of what we would have done at other levels if it had got to armed conflict. We sent him into a country that did not have a place for him to live, an appropriate place for him to live. You do not treat the ambassador of the United States of America, the number one world power, that way. They had to change their entire upper level housing policy because the United States sent a black diplomat. That was our point. Um, I'm sure, you know, if, if troops had gone in, no, of course they wouldn't have been segregated. That's absurd. Well, uh, I, it's a little hard to answer the question because you're asking, would we have sent troops in to support South Africa? We didn't. And why, why, under what conditions would we have sent troops in to support South Africa? South Africa was doing fine in repressing its own population. They didn't need our troops. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if I can just add, my assumption was that the troops were in to, to oppose apartheid. I, I thought that's oh, what that you, meant. you meant. I assumed that's what you meant. Well, we wouldn't have sent no. troops to oppose apartheid. Period. No, uh, sure sent troops in to if support the government of, of, of If uh, South Africa had been invaded, I suppose. Is the... anyway. Okay. Well, I, both our gentlemen have uh, pressing time commitments, both our panelists, but we do want to thank them very much for taking the time to come up here.